thanks very much, Paul. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the traditional custodians of the lands that I live and work on, and we live in, many of us live and work on, and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples past and present. So hopefully you can see um, my PowerPoint and hopefully a little thing of me as well, but very small, I hope. Um, so I was, I was very pleased to be invited to talk about the Oxford English Dictionary, which um, in this series, I think it probably um, deserves to have a place. Um, I guess just before I get started talking about the OED, I just wanted to, to make a couple of points. First was to say that I really come at this topic from the perspective of both a historian, um, a trained historian who works in history, um, who casts a critical eye on texts and their contexts, and so I want to bring something of that to my, what I'm going to say about the OED. But I also come at, come at it as a working lexicographer and one who works on a dictionary based on historical principles that is modelled on the Oxford English Dictionary. So even though I can um, make some critical comments about the OED, I also have some sympathy with the problems um, that are faced by working lexicographers when they have to um, deal with some of the challenges of working on um, uh, these kinds of projects, which are enormous projects and have a lot of moving parts. So I guess that's just one of the first things I want to say. The other thing I say here is just on my um, introductory slide here, I put an asterisk next to the word book, and this might be something that gets taken up in, in question time. But um, I was thinking about the extent to which, I mean, I know that the series kind of talks about and challenges and debates the question of whether or not these particular texts change humanity. But I also thought I'd just raise the question of the extent to which we think about the OED as a book. Um, and I think that depends on your definition of what constitutes a book. But I've also put an, as an asterisk there to say, we can also think about it as a reference work in numerous parts, in several editions that has changed over time since the first edition came out. And now we have to think about it as an ever expanding digital resource that is much too big to ever publish. And this, of course, also shapes the kind of story that we tell about it. So my talk today is essentially the first half is, is kind of telling the story of the Oxford English Dictionary, um, what was behind it, how it evolved across time, who were the people who were involved in creating the Oxford English Dictionary. And then the second half of my talk is really talking about aspects of its significance. And I can't cover you know, everything in this talk, but I hope I'll touch on a few different aspects and themes that came out of my thinking about the Oxford English Dictionary and some of the criticisms that have been made about the Oxford English Dictionary um, by scholars um, over the last, um, you know, few decades. So starting off, I'll always press the wrong button, um, with a brief history of the Oxford English Dictionary. And here I just want to acknowledge a debt to um, a number of books that have been written about the history of the Oxford English Dictionary. Peter Gilliver's recent work in particular, The Making of the Oxford English Dictionary, um, which came out a few years ago and is a mighty tome, a, a, a very detailed and very granular look at um, almost a blow by blow account of the making of the first edition um, and is, is a very um, thorough uh, history of the OED. Um, Sarah Ogilvie's Words of the World, uh, which looks at the question of varieties of English within um, the OED. Charlotte Brewer's Treasure House of the Language, The Living OED, which focuses um, very much on the second edition and then the um, digitized edition of the OED. Um, it's a bit old now, but also um, a very valuable and interesting work. There are many other histories, of course, Simon Winchester's perhaps being the most um, famous, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So oh, I always press the button on my keyboard instead of the mouse, and <laughs> then it makes a noise, sorry. The other thing I'll just show here um, are just a couple of sample entries. I'm sure you all are very familiar with the Oxford English Dictionary and um, its layout. But here's just an entry, um, some entries from the first edition, um, just to give you a sense of what um, an entry would look like in um, the first edition of the OED. So as you can see, um, in terms of the way it used abbreviations, the way it was laid out, it was quite um, a dense kind of text and quite um, challenging to make use of. Um, 
today, and there's the same entry, there's Fulgurite um, back then, and here it is um, today. As you can see, um, the Oxford English Dictionary as an online product um, today is not only considerably updated, um, it's also much easier to use. And I'll talk um, a bit about these kinds of things as, as we go through, but that's just to give you a sense of, of how it's evolved across time. Stop pressing that button. Okay, so starting with the, um, the sort of first idea, I guess, that brought um, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary into being. Well, in May 1857, Herbert Coleridge uh, on the left, Frederick Furnival in the middle, and Richard Chevney Trench um, on the right there, all members of the Philological Society, um, formed a committee to collect unregistered words in English. Um, and in November of that same year, Trench gave his famous paper on some deficiencies of our English dictionaries that identified the need for a new dictionary of English. It was quite some time since Johnson's um, significant dictionary had come out in 1755. Meanwhile, uh, Webster in the United States had produced his dictionary. First edition came out in 1828. Um, so there was perceived to be a need for a comprehensive dictionary of the English language. The, idea, the ideal dictionary, Trench argued, would be what he called an inventory of the language and the lexicographer would act as the language's historian. So there was very much that idea of the historical method was there from the beginning. The ideal dictionary would document each word and would provide the evidence, the earliest evidence of that word and, and show its progression. But Trench's paper also conceived of this project as being a national one. So there was an element of um, British nationalism that played its part as well um, in what Trench was envisioning. The dictionary would be, um, to quote Trench, the history of a nation contemplated from one point of view. Trench's paper was subsequently published and then the Philological Society announced that they were launching a scheme to develop this ideal dictionary. The historical lexicographical method was not necessarily something that was new. Um, the Germans had pioneered uh, the method with the publication of Franz Passau's Handwörterbuch der Griech, I'm um, pronouncing this correctly, Griechischen Sprache, sorry, Christina, <laughs> in, uh, published in 1819, that used quotations to illustrate the life of words. And also Grimm, the Brothers Grimm's Deutsches Wörterbuch, um, which was begun in 1838, which would prove to be a hundred odd um, year project, um, were already begun by the time the Oxford English Dictionary lexicographers were, were starting their work. And of course, I've already mentioned Johnson and Webster's um, dictionaries that had already been published by the stage. But nevertheless, the OED project was um, conceived of as being something new. And Coleridge, Furnival and Trench firmly believed that it would set a new standard and pioneer um, a new methodology for undertaking lexicography. For the next 20 years or so after the launch of the project, however, progress was pretty fitful. Coleridge worked on the project um, until he died in 1861. Furnival worked on the project for a while, but while he was described, and Peter Gillibar has a lot on this, um, talks uh, quite a bit about how energetic and enthusiastic um, Furnival was, he was also terribly disorganized. And so nothing much was done and slips were lost and all sorts of um, problems were encountered. So that all sort of fell into a bit of a heap. It was the appointment of uh, James Murray to the editing role in 1879 that would substantially change things. When Murray was appointed, some of the dictionaries conventions were already in place. And it's worth noting that, of course, Murray's kind of thought of as the father of the OED, but um, some of those quotations, um, some of those conventions were already there. Um, quotation evidence was already being reported on the famous slips, many of which, as I mentioned, Furnival managed to lose for quite some time. Um, discussions had been had taken place around questions of what the dictionary's scope would be, what would actually be included in this great dictionary. And works were already being read to find the quotation evidence that would be used for this dictionary. But Murray's appointment would, of course, be pretty central to uh, the project really starting to take off. So here, um, one of the first things that he did was really to set up to draw up a set of uh, instructions, directions to readers to tell them what they needed to do um, and to take quotations. An appeal was put out 
published in newspapers and flyers, distributed in bookshops and the like to find readers. And books are actually identified, as you can see there, a list of books for which readers are wanted. So they actually wanted people to read these um, so-called great works um, of literature. Murray also quickly made decisions with respect um, of principles of inclusion, what would actually go in this dictionary. Words that had become obsolete before 1100 were not to be included was a decision that was made early on. Um, there was also a decision not to include geographical and personal names. The category of slang, obscene and erotic words uh, was considerably more pr problematic. How do you draw the line around those? What, what falls into that category and what doesn't? And the guidelines certainly at the beginning, and this really continued to be the case, remained um, pretty unclear as it did for loan words, so words coming in from other languages, um, and also technical words. So a lot of technology, um, scientific kind of um, terminology didn't make it into the first edition. As we'll see, um, these questions of what goes in and what stays out of a dictionary are not necessarily always based on, on a sort of clear lexicographical principle. Um, and sometimes you're not consistent in what you do. And I think given um, you know, the, 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 the vast time period that the first edition, um, you know, went over, um, it, was, it was difficult to be absolute in terms of what you put in. So, for example, um, African was left out on the principle of geographical names, but um, by the time they got to American, they decided, oh, no, we need American, so it went in. And that was more a case of, of minds being changed as they'd gone along rather than, than some kind of, of particular prejudice against the word African. Evidence for words um, was also a subject um, for some discussion. So it's a dictionary based on historical principles. They were going to look for um, usage, earliest usage, um, but what was the kind of evidence that they were going to represent in the dictionary? Well, um, they wanted the great writers of English literature, as you can see from the list of books. These are the things that they consider that they want to see represented in the dictionary. But there was considerable debate over the use of more ephemeral kinds of literature um, and publications such as newspapers and pamphlets and the like. And um, although Murray himself was actually quite inclusive and, and more inclined to include those kinds of materials, um, some of the others were, were a little more um, uh, snippy about wanting to, wanting to include them. So Murray built his famous scriptorium, um, the first of which was built at his house um, at Mill House, where he was uh, working as a school teacher when he began working on this project. So he was, um, if you read Peter Gilliver's book, the ongoing issue of how they were going to actually pay the lexicographers is something that went on for years. And when he starts it, he's really uh, not really being paid very much at all and he had to continue working. Later, he, he moves to Oxford. Um, but Murray very quickly um, sets to work. It was, it was always gonna be the case that this dictionary was gonna take a lot of work, a lot of time um, and take a number of years, but I think Few, when they started it, guessed that it would be as big an undertaking as it proved to be. The first fascicle of the dictionary, so the first part of a part um, covering words from A to Ant was published in 1884. Reviews were pretty much uniformly positive in the UK and the dictionary undoubtedly appealed um, to a sense of national pride. Um, of course, it was known as the new English dictionary um, through this first edition. Not long after Murray um, was persuaded to move to Oxford on the basis that they would actually pay him some decent compensation, but he had to move to Oxford in order to, to get this. Um, and I should say that, you know, if you think about the, the making of dictionaries, um, financial, financial considerations um, are actually a, a huge part of what can shape um, a particular text. By this stage, the project was becoming an Oxford University Press project. They were increasingly um, taking ownership of it and planning to publish it. So this gave the dictionary something of a home, but it also meant that the famous uh, delegates of Oxford University Press, so the people, the mysterious people who seem to have to wield a great deal of influence amongst, uh, uh, amongst these, everything, um, had influence over this project. Now, from Peter Gilliver's accounts, um, this seemed mostly to be around efforts to keep costs down. Um, as you might expect, they kept saying, this is costing too much money, you better, you know, rein it in, rein it in, don't keep doing so as much as you're doing. Um, and twas ever thus, because that feels like the way pop lexicography works these days as well. Um, and to try and keep the dictionary shorter. So limit the extent of the dictionary. And they used Webster's dictionary as the yardsticks. There was lots of um, 
you know, debate, you know, we only wanted to be, well, ultimately they said to Murray, we wanted to be six times the length of Webster and you can't have it any longer than that. Of course, it wound up being longer than that, but that was what they were trying to, to kind of hold him to use as a measure. So Murray was joined as he had to be by other um, editors. There was no way Murray could do all this work by himself. Um, Henry Bradley joined as an editor in 1888. William Craigie in the middle there joined the project in the 1890s, first as an assistant and then later he became third editor in 1901. In 1905, Charles Onions was brought on as an additional editor. Um, but of course, there were many other people who worked on the dictionary as well. Um, this is quite a late photo, but Murray's daughters, he had 11 children, and a few of them worked on the dictionary. Um, uh, Ethel, I think, and Ross Frith, I might be getting those names wrong, um, worked on the dictionary. Um, there were, of course, many um, other people who uh, provided um, their labour through the reading of those works. So when that appeal went out, many people volunteered to read. Um, some of the famous names, of, co of course, include um, William Chester Minor, an American Civil War veteran um, who was also a doctor, and um, uh, the famous madman of the professor in the madman Simon Winchester's book. Um, he was incarcerated at Broadmoor uh, for murdering someone um, due to uh, mental illness. And Australian professor at the University of Melbourne, um, Edward Ellis Morris, who was a very contrib great contributor to the dictionary, but also of course compiled Austral English using some of the principles um, of the OED. So that was, they were all important contributors. Um, there were many sub editors and assistants to editors who um, worked on the dictionary as well. So it's often sort of thought of as this kind of project, project of Murray's and he's the person who's identified with it, but it was a team effort. There were many people who worked on it. So entries would be worked on um, on slips. And as you can see here, here are just some of the bundles of slips for entries. Um, another interesting thing here is, of course, here's one of these requests where Murray was sending it out to some of his readers. Uh, for example, William Chester Minor uh, was a great um, reader and worked with Murray on this. So he would send out this request for quotations for particular words, and then his readers would go and read uh, whatever works they had, and you know, Minor even in Broadmoor had a great library, um, would look for evidence for these particular words. The entries were then transformed into um, typeset text um, and set as galley proofs um, by the typesetters. Um, and Linda Muggleston has written a really interesting work um, analyzing um, the amount of work that was done when these um, entries were put into uh, galley proofs. So a lot of work was still done once it had gone off to the typesetters and put into type and came back in galley proofs. And that could include adding new quotation evidence, um, changing definitions, moving the sense orders around. So there was still a lot of work that went in there and her scholarship has kind of looked at how important decisions could actually be made at a fairly late stage um, of, the, of the process. Decisions, of course, also had to be made around things like uh, what your preferred headword spelling was going to be, what your preferred forms were going to be, um, and the dreaded cross-references. And if you think if you're working on a dictionary that's actually coming out in parts, the decisions you make about cross-references in your first part of your alphabet have to kind of work for later in the alphabet because you might not be getting to those later um, entries until much later. So the bane of any lexicographer, I think, uh, especially in a big dictionary like this is um, cross-referencing. Um, it's a very tricky, tricky thing to get right. Questions of inclusion, of course, persisted um, through uh, the work on the first edition. For example, there was much debate over the inclusion of obscene words. Um, and of course, I couldn't resist getting in a few obscene words um, given, my, given my own uh, kind of research interests. Um, but some were included, um, piss, shit and bitch, all made it into the first edition. But the two big four letter words, um, cunt and fuck, did not. Um, and it was not so much that Murray didn't want to include them, because in fact, he was um, fairly open to the idea of including them. But of course, it was the fact that the press couldn't publish it um, without um, causing uh, quite a bit of um, a difficulty for the press. And I should note that Oxford University Press's um, biggest uh, seller at this time, their number one bestseller was the Bible. Um, and so it might have been an interesting question for the press's reputation. The delegates would not have come near it, but would have been an interesting question for um, the uh, publishers. 
Um, there were a couple of passing references elsewhere in the dictionary, uh, the word quaint, um, a punning substitute for cunt made it in, and entries for windfucker and one fucked made it into the dictionary. And um, I guess uh, they were well buried. Um, you weren't going to be easy, you know, easily, uh, no, weren't going to find them easily. So um, it allowed for those things to be a little bit buried. Now, before the dictionary um, finished, of course, um, some of the key figures um, passed on um, and died. Berneval died in 1910. Murray, who had received his knighthood in 1908, died in 1915. And that picture I showed you earlier um, was taken just before he died, I think literally like a few days or a week before. Um, in 1923, uh, Bradley died. So quite a few of the, the key figures in the making of the dictionary didn't actually see it published. Worth noting the contribution of perhaps one um, other assistant um, just before we get to the end of the, the story of the first edition, um, that's J.R.R. Tolkien, which many people would know has a connection to the OED. He worked on um, W words for a year under Bradley, I think 1919, so just after the First World War, um, which he had served in. The first edition of the, as it was then known, uh, New English Dictionary was finally completed in 1928. Copies of the entire set were presented to King George V and to President Calvin uh, Coolidge in the United States. Craigie had been working and living in the United States on a fellowship for some time through the end um, of working on the OED, so um, perhaps that's why uh, it went to Calvin Coolidge, but I think it's an interesting transatlantic dimension to the story of the OED, which often is seen more in an imperial context than a transatlantic context, perhaps. Work was then undertaken on a supplement published in 1933, and the dictionary was released in 12 volumes. The project then went into abeyance. While other dictionary projects were undertaken at Oxford, um, some quite considerably considerable scholarly projects, as well as um, a move towards producing uh, more general dictionaries, the OED was not really worked on again, worked on again until Robert Birchfield, a New Zealander, was appointed to work on it in 1957. A new reading program was launched under Birchfield, um, and notably uh, just mention uh, the writer Margarita Lasky, who not only contributed thousands of quotations from a diverse range of uh, her favorite reading matter, which included detective novels and modern writers like uh, Shaw and Aldous Huxley, as well as popular magazines. Um, and so she was a, a notable and prolific um, contributor to uh, the supplement. But she was also an advocate for the Oxford English Dictionary, which by this stage was starting to, to really gain, um, you know, it's sort of been a bit forgotten, um, but was now regaining um, a kind of reputation um, for being an important work um, in the lexicographical field. And she was a great advocate for the OED, writing about it in the press, promoting it within her literary and journalistic circles. The work that would be done under Birchfield's leadership included a focus on scientific and technical vocabulary, um, of course, items from World Varieties of English, which Sarah Ogilvie has looked at in um, some detail in her book and the question of whether or not he actually included much of that and how he treated it. And a reconsideration of the four letter words, which finally had to um, be reconsidered for getting into uh, the dictionary. Birchfield continued to regard the OED as a reporter of the language of great writers and included many quotations from writers that he regarded as such um, well-cited writers of the supplement include George Bernard Shaw, James Joyce, Rudyard Kipling and H.G. Wells and some detailed studies have been made on the most cited writers but, but they are some of the most cited writers in the supplement. His focus on world Englishes, as I mentioned already, Sarah Ogilvy has been quite critical of it um, and seen it to be um, patchy and it, it does seem, even though her critique has also been critiqued and people have disagreed with it, it does seem that there was at least some question over which items from World Varieties of English made it in um, and which didn't and exactly how he made some of those judgments. The first instalment of Birchfield's supplement was published in 1972 and Birchfield's, uh, and the supplement was completed in 1986. Meanwhile, the first use of computers um, began um, through this period. John Simpson, who had begun working for the OED in 1976, became a leading figure overseeing the computerization or digitization of the dictionary. He also headed up a new words project, which collected words in areas such as computing, business and lifestyle, as well as words that reflected a changing multicultural Britain and using different kinds of sources. Um, so using things like magazines to a much greater extent than, than the sort of traditional 
focus on literary um, sources. And his um, account of his time in the OED, The Word Detected of a Life in Words from Serendipity to Selfie, is a really entertaining um, and interesting, if you're interested in lexicography and the, the process of working on dictionaries, um, is a really um, interesting account. And he talks quite a bit at length about the whole process of putting together, you know, moving to a kind of um, online dictionary um, and so forth. So Simpson was given the task of making the second edition. So essentially the second edition, which many of you will have probably used, um, might even have on your shelves um, because it was the one that was, was more ubiquitous um, through sort of recent working times, um, was basically the first edition integrated with the uh, various supplements plus the new words that Simpson had been working on and he was sort of put it all together. Um, and it was published in 1988. He was subsequently made chief editor and then the next step was the creation of OED Online, which was launched in 2000. Simpson continued on as chief editor until he retired in 2013, and the current chief editor is Michael Prophet. Methods, of course, have considerably changed um, in recent times since um, the move towards uh, using uh, computers in lexicography. The digital has not only changed the delivery of the dictionary, but also the methods of the lexicographer. Well, until the advent of the internet, the collection of evidence was based on reading programs, um, choosing to, to look at the great works of literature. Um, and editors made their choices from quotations that were, were found there. But now large data, databases, digital sources, um, web crawlers to find things um, on the web, Google Books, all of these things are now, of course, absolutely central. And that has changed the kinds of sources that are being used by the dictionary. And to some extent, perhaps democratized the dictionary certainly um, allowed for a much wider range of voices to be heard um, in the dictionary. But I guess that moves me now, and I, I should say to Paul, um, if, you, <laughs> if you haven't fallen asleep yet, um, listening to me go on about this, um, if you could just keep an eye on the time because I, I might run over time. So if you do need me to wind up, um, you might want to give me um, a bit of a hurry up at some point. I will. <laughs> so the next um, section is to look at the uh, OED significance. And I really just wanted to touch on, I guess, a few themes and things that I thought were um, interesting. And like I said, sort of coming at it both from the perspective of a historian trying to be critical of a particular text that's rooted in its time and place, um, as well as, as thinking about it as a lexicographer. I mean, I think probably the, the most, uh, you know, key thing is to sort of think about it as a text that really reflects its um, time and place and how things have changed across time. The first edition was very much um, a reflection of um, Britain in the 19th century and the kinds of ways of seeing the world and thinking about um, both the world and thinking about language at a particular point in time. The scientific approach was of course absolutely central to the way in which um, the lexicographers were, were approaching their task and thinking about it. It was evidence-based. They were going to look at language from the point of view of evidence and employ a scientific method um, both to find evidence um, to underpin the uh, dictionary entries, but also to apply a kind of scientific and rigorous way of thinking about language and the relationship between words and the re relationship between languages. The dictionary was also a product of the 19th century in the sense of it being intended to be a national project. It was intended to reflect the glories of Britain, its language and its civilization. Certainly Trench envisioned this. I don't know if the work, the, you know, the lexicographers who worked on it were as preoccupied with this concern, but it was certainly something that Trench um, talked about. And so I think interesting kinds of decisions are ultimately made about what kind of vision of the English language is going to be presented in the dictionary, what's going to go in and what's going to be left out. And we've talked about the things that, that they decided were going to be left out. But there are other things that were perhaps not as um, clearly represented in the dictionary. For example, regional dialect words, some went in, but many were left to be chronicled or recorded in projects like the English dialect dictionary. Slang words was kind of a, a difficult um, category to, to include in the dictionary or to, to think about what part of slang was going to be included and what wasn't. And much of that language and vocabulary was left um, to the slang lexicographers to chronicle. So it was telling a particular story um, about the English language at a particular point of time and, and what they wanted it to be and what, what kind of image of English of the English language they wanted to convey. John Walensky, who's written a critical study of the OED, writes that while Murray 
um, certainly made the dictionary more liberal in reach than we perhaps could expect for a product of um, the 19th century. It was nevertheless still destined to tell a story that fit remarkably well with the ideological needs of the modern European nation state. And I guess that ties into the kinds of criticisms that have also been made of the OED as being an, an imperial and a colonialist project. Um, and I think there are a few ways in which you can think about it as being um, a, an imperial or colonial project. Um, of course, as a text, it reflected the world as it was understood as the time, uh, at the time. It was um, the world of the British Empire. So there are elements in which it reflected um, that, its definitions, its perspective on the world uh, was shaped by, by the time in which it was created. So if you think about definitions or even the quotation evidence that was selected um, to, to um, define um, particular entries. Another way of thinking about it as an imperial and colonialist project is perhaps thinking about the way in which English was being exported through the 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, the dictionary, certainly in the 20th century, was a kind of key text um, in the export of the English language, um, the educa English educate, British education in different parts um, of the empire, and even in decolonizing countries. Of course, Oxford University Press as an educational publisher um, was, was hugely um, influential, well, even to, to this day, but certainly through much of the 20th century. We can also think about the ways in which it was a product of Western notions of thinking about time and evidence and knowledge. And this is something I think about um, in terms of the Australian National Dictionary and in terms of thinking about how we, um, we might think about how we might decolonize um, the dictionary to a greater extent. Um, but in a sense, the dictionary itself is a kind of product of a particular way of thinking about, um, thinking about history, historical change, thinking about evidence and thinking about knowledge. We perhaps also need to acknowledge um, its particular views on gender and class as a like first edition 19th century text. Both of these are issues that have been taken up in a really interesting way in Pip Williams' novel, The Dictionary of Lost Words, which some of you might have read. I think it's a very interesting um, book in terms of the way in which it tries to engage with, with some of these questions. So she in particular touches on this issue of evidence and how you consider like, if your evidence is really printed, published works, what, is, what are the words that you're not recording as a result of that? And, and she kind of uses the, the example of the working class women who um, her, her protagonist, Esme, goes out and talks to in the markets and how their words, and they say their words are never going to get into the dictionary. Um, so there are interesting ways in which gender and class play, um, play out um, in the Oxford English Dictionary. And I think Pip Williams kind of touches on that in some, some interesting kinds of ways. So that's perhaps the things that I'm sure people will have questions about and want to, to perhaps argue about um, in question time. So the other question uh, or other theme I wanted to take up here was just the, the question of descriptivism versus prescriptivism and where the OED, um, you know, thinking about the OED in these terms. Of course, the Oxford English Dictionary was very much um, trying to be an exercise in descriptivism. That is, they were describing, not prescribing the language. They weren't trying to say, this is how you should use it. Um, you know, this way is the appropriate way of using language. But of course, there are, you know, all dictionaries to some extent wind up playing some kind of prescriptivist role. And I think it could be fair to say that the OED formed part of a kind of process whereby language was being made more uniform, more standardized through the 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, you know, choosing what words you put in and what words you don't put in can um, feed into ideas around what words are considered legitimate um, and which words are not considered legitimate. Historical lexicographers do try to stick to a kind of descriptivist um, kind of approach to things, but of course, you're always making choices in how you um, treat words, even if you include them, how you treat them is also, um, a, you know, a question that ultimately comes down to a particular editor's um, perspective on things or particular criteria that the dictionary is going to take. So, for example, by the time Birchfield is editing the OED in the 70s and 80s, times had certainly changed in terms of thinking about racist language. So, of course, the 19th century, there was, you know, entries that we would now find um, pretty offensive um, in, the, in the first edition. 
But um, Birchfield had the opportunity to kind of make some pretty significant changes and updates to um, some of that stuff, um, was fairly conservative in how he approached it. For example, he chose not to include reclamation senses of the word black in reference to a person of colour, even though by the 1970s and 1980s, there was plenty of evidence of that kind of, of use of the word. He um, was very strong on not providing any kind of usage guidance in terms of words that might be considered offensive, um, because again, he kind of used the kind of descriptivist approach for just describing the language. But I think these days we'd be a lot more um, sensitive to that. And I should say, I was looking at a, a, a 1989 second edition entry for the word Negro. And it was quite astonishing to me that um, just how, um, you know, uh, well, really offensive, some of the way in which it had been set out, the lack of usage guidance, the way the definition said things like of and pertaining to Negroes um, in their definitions. Um, that was, was quite a, a confronting thing. And clearly that hadn't really been changed for the second edition. So sometimes um, some of these changes can be um, more on the conservative side, I suppose, than, than necessarily taking a progressive stance. Um, John Simpson's, uh, in his book, um, very strongly asserts in a number of different places through that book that the lexicographer must remain absolutely neutral. And he says this quite a few times. He says, people ask me what my favourite word is. I don't have a favourite word because I can't have a favourite word. I can't play favourites. I have to be absolutely neutral, um, which I think, you know, is perhaps um, an interesting kind of stand uh, to take. But he was very clear about um, trying to remain absolutely neutral and objective in how he treats things but I think it's very difficult um, to, to actually uh, put that into practice and so the ongoing issue for example of how to treat um, offensive language um, both of the four letter and discriminatory variety I think um, is kind of an ongoing thing and, and generally the dictionary can be and certainly the OED has been, been kind of criticized for being fairly conservative um, recently questions around sexist language and so forth um, that these things can be particularly fraught. So another issue that comes up is, is the question of source material and, and the kind of uh, types of material that's privileged in the OED. So um, of course the, the first edition, as I've already talked about, kind of was about trying to elevate uh, the great writers um, of what, what were considered to be the great writers of the English language. Um, and perhaps even Walensky, I think, argues helped canonize um, some of these writers. Shakespeare, of course, was the most cited writer in the first edition, um, and arguably the dictionary helped in that process of, of canonising uh, the importance of, of Shakespeare in the language. And interestingly, of course, included a number of terms that were only ever used by Shakespeare um, were included in the dictionary. Uh, James Joyce, um, similarly in the, in, the, in the supplements, was, was very well represented, perhaps overly represented for somebody who used language in, in, in fairly idiosyncratic ways. Um, and, and there's been some questions around the use of this kind of literary or poetic language um, as evidence of usage in, in the dictionary. Um, I guess the equivalent for us um, doing the Australian National Dictionary is someone like Barry Humphreys, who uses um, language in a very creative and, and um, distinctive and individual way. Some of those terms, of course, get taken up in more broader use, but some don't. And would we want to represent him because he is a great exemplar of, of Australian English? Um, that would be sort of the equivalent of it. Um, I think the answer is probably no, because of course our principles have changed a bit um, since then. But of course, that's been one of the things that has been a source of criticism when it comes to the OED. But the source of source base is now, um, certainly in recent times, changed considerably. As I said, the, the, the introduction of digital um, sources, the ability to search databases, the creation of databases, all these kinds of things has really shifted it. And perhaps most recently, and we're not really seeing the impact of this play out just yet, but the impact of social media and the use of social media as um, an evidence base, I think will um, you know, have an impact on, on what, um, what we see happening in the dictionary. And being online, of course, that allows for a lot more responsiveness, I suppose, to um, some of those words that come into the language um, and, and sort of gain a lot of traction very quickly. Um, John Simpson was very keen to say, well, they would only put a word in the dictionary if it was settled in the language. 
but I think we've been seeing examples of, you know, for example, Omnishambles, which was used of the, uh, when London hosted the Olympics and has sort of come up again. I think that made it into the dictionary, I hope, <laughs> since it's the example I'm citing. But I think there tends to be a, 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 a there's a move, even, even with the OED, to, to be quicker in terms of putting some of these things in the dictionary now. Brief mention, of course, the influence of the OED has been um, the dictionaries that have followed it and have been modelled on it, um, including ours, the Australian National Dictionary, um, which uh, the first edition, um, which is the top left one there, um, was uh, Bill Ramson's project. Um, he was developing the A&D in the 70s and 80s, and he tried to find in his in his memoir. He he says that he he would have liked to have he would have liked the dictionary to be presented in an Australian way, and he uses this phrase the Australian an Australian way, but doesn't really say quite what that would have looked like or what he thought that would be. And I think he actually found there wasn't a way of presenting it in an Australian way, and so he accepted um, or came to the conclusion that the Oxford formula best fitted the historical method. And so that was what um, the A&D went with. And of course, it became an Oxford University Press project, although it didn't start that way. Um, the second edition um, edited by Bruce Moore, of course, is, has continued in the same, um, same tradition. The A&D um, benefited, of course, from its links to, to the Oxford, the OED project. John Simpson um, was one of the advisors. Um, there was access to OED card evidence. It was published by Oxford University Press. And Oxford, as you can see, is sort of keep their hands on a lot of these dictionaries through uh, the later um, part of the 20th century. Um, the Dictionary of South African English, the Dictionary of New Zealand English. So the Commonwealth um, well represented with dictionaries of uh, based on historical principles in this mould. But more broadly, of course, um, Oxford have um, very much established themselves as an influence in the educational publishing field through uh, the 20th century. Um, and many Oxford dictionaries, of course, benefit from this connection to the um, OED and, and you know, sort of saying that it's all based on the, the research that goes into the OED. And that continues, I think, to be the case today. Um, you know, it may shift in the future, but it's certainly, um, you know, been, it's still quite a, a powerhouse in, in the educational field. The OED thus is, is one of perhaps the most iconic reference works, even if people don't use it, they kind of are familiar with it or have some idea about it. They might not quite know what it is, but they do have some idea about it. Um, and it continues to have um, a lot of value. Well, I'll be interested to know, maybe people in, in questions might want to, to kind of dispute this, but I think it still um, has, um, you know, a, a definite role to play. Um, you know, it's one of the iconic reference works next to something like the Encyclopedia Britannica, but the Britannica has essentially gone the way of the dodo with, um, you know, Wikipedia, and um, I don't think we've quite seen that in the lexicographical field um, because of the nature of, the, nature of lexicography, I suppose, but, um, you yeah, know, that may change in the future, but to this point, it's still um, an essential um, kind of reference work. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning, although it's not particularly, perhaps not that interesting to people, but I guess the, the development of, of the, the kind of work that was done in creating the OED as an online reference work, creating searchable and tagged text. Um, this is one of the things that the OED currently is very much pushing. Um, and I am almost finished, Paul, if you're about to tell me I'm running out of time. Um, it, it is that it has been really, they're really trying to pioneer new ways of using dictionary data. So they've been running a lot of webinars and seminars um, online for researchers who want to use the data that goes into uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. So that's definitely something that they continue to try and, and be fairly pioneering. So I just wanted to conclude with basically just a couple of points about the kind of cultural um, elements, impact, if you like, of the OED. Of course, the OED also kind of lives in this kind of slightly mythological um, place where, you know, you may not use it, but you've kind of heard of it and maybe you've read a book about it. So The Surgeon of Crowthorn, which was published in America as the Professor and the Mad Men, A Tale of Murder Madness in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is actually really quite an entertaining book if you haven't already read it. Probably most people have because it was a huge bestseller. Um, and the, the, the movie that was made um, based on it, uh, starring uh, Mel Gibson as James Murray and Sean Penn as uh, William Chester Minor. Um, I was going to watch it before I gave this talk, but I haven't yet kind of worked my way up to seeing it. It was a bit of a flop um, or there was issues about distributing it or something. But um, if you want to watch a movie about lexicography, this is probably your best 
chance at it because I suspect there's not much chance anyone's going to make another movie um, about uh, dictionary making. And this one I suspect is very dramatised, but um, no, no, might be an interesting thing. Um, and of course, Pip Williams' um, work, uh, recent work, I just wanted to mention this. I mentioned it earlier, but I think it is really interesting that this book has proven to be extremely popular. Um, it was sixth on the Australian fiction bestseller list for 2020. Um, and Pip, who is a British-born Australian novelist, tells a really interesting story. I don't necessarily agree absolutely with everything um, in terms of the kinds of things that she sees as being the decisions that go into what goes into the dictionary and what doesn't. But I think what it does do is to bring a really um, interesting critical perspective in a kind of fictional form um, to the story uh, of, of the, or the absence of women in the story of the OED um, and the ways in which gender and class um, shape the inclusion and exclusion of certain entries in the dictionary. So my final conclusion was just really about um, whether the OED actually um, changed humanity, which I know people uh, will be wanting to know, how do I think this, uh, the OED changed humanity? Well, I had a few points here that I thought about, and I, sh I should say, I think English speaking humanity is probably where I, I'd sort of say it's more, more relevant. Um, the elevation, elevation and promotion of the English language and a particular vision of what the English language um, might be, and it's linked to British empire and power. So I think thinking about British and American English also as remaining very central to the OED even to this day, even though it does represent to some extent varieties of English. I think another way in which it has had an impact is its relationship to education. So the Oxford brand and how it's helped to underpin the Oxford educational publishing brand, especially through the 20th century, I think has had a, a very big impact. More abstractly, perhaps the way in which it ordered and disciplined language and shaped our understanding of and, and um, certainly in the past, um, our relationship to and our use of language. So even though it attempted, you know, wanted to be very much descriptivist, it did have a prescriptivist effect and sort of fitting into the, the broader story of dictionaries, uh, the way in which dictionaries are kind of used to, to kind of shape attitudes and police attitudes and, and use of language. So I think um, yeah, the OED perhaps fits into that broader story as well. But I'm sure um, people will have questions um, and thoughts and I welcome, I welcome those.